The Secrets of Star Trek is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, Episode 75. Captain DeBridge. Spock here. Make himself. Surrender is not an option. Attention crew of the Enterprise, this is James Kirk. We are all explorers, driven to know what's over the horizon, what's beyond our own shores. We would have helped you get home if you had asked. That's who Starfleet is. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. And today we're discussing Babel, a Deep Space Nine first season episode. And joining me today on the panel is Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Father Corey couldn't be with us this week, uh, so we're, we're we're going uh, without our chaplain uh, into uh, the 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 far no, that's the far the away outer galaxies reaches of, of deep space. Yes, uh, on the in the in the Bajor sector. So. Uh, We're talking about this episode uh, from the first season of Deep Space Nine, and it's the fourth episode of that first season, the fourth to air, and it is named Babel, which should be familiar to us. In fact, uh, it doesn't, that word doesn't come up in the episode at all, uh, but they've named it Babel. Could you explain to listeners what Babel is in the Bible? Sure. So uh, Babel is a location in Mesopotamia, uh, where famously the Tower of Babel was built. It was an attempt of man to usurp the place of God, and so God confused the tongues of the people building the temple, leading to many different languages and the inability to understand each other, which is crucial to the plot of this episode. Right. I mean, that's that must be the the, the part they're getting at is, is that confusing the tongues and people are not able to understand each other um, yeah. and seeing how, <laughs> what that would be like for the those. Uh, so interestingly, the, so the plot is that, uh, you know, in, in, in brief, that something happens that a sort of disease of some sort gives everybody aphasia. Right. They're and, uh, unable to communicate, but also understand. Yeah, so this is global aphasia. They're unable to correctly process language input, and they're unable to process correctly language output. There are different types of aphasia. Some of them, like Wernicke's aphasia, interfere with your ability to understand, but you may still be able to talk uh, coherently or semi-coherently. So if someone says to you, do you like your job, and you have Wernicke's aphasia, you may say, yes, I am. (laughs) Yeah. And but then there are other types of aphasia where you can't understand what's being said to you, and or you you can understand if what's being said to you, but then you can't give sensible output. And then there are other types of disorder where you have something called alexia. I didn't I didn't activate my echo. No, <laughs> and and agraphia, which is the inability to read and write, um, though that's uh, not always the same. Yeah, and this there's at least Alexia in this one because um they we get a perspective from uh from Dr. Bashir's point of view where he's looking at a screen and he's looking at it at one second it makes sense and the next second it's all just random words. I remember from the first time I saw this he saw the phrase golden window right. or gold window um as one of the bits of nonsense input he would see on the screen. Yeah, one of the things that in in the real world, uh, if you get aphasia, it does not. It's not caused by a viral infection and does not result in death. Right, um, it's caused by brain trauma, typically. Yeah, and and it's, it's the, the, so that's this is a sci-fi version of it that looks like what we know of as aphasia. Uh, Interestingly, from the writing perspective, uh, the guy who did the scripting for this started out writing the aphasic dialogue as just gibberish, but then he realized that's going to be hard for the actors to pull off. And so he actually knew what he wanted them to say and would like write what they were trying to say in parentheses. And then he matched it to other words that had the same meter. 
so they right. could deliver the line as if it was sensible and as if they were trying to say something and it would sound natural even though the words were completely wrong. Right. And I think it worked really well. I think uh especially Colomini um you you really get a sense of you know, he's acting. He's got the 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 emotion that he's trying to convey even though the words we hear are completely nonsense, which I suppose in uh you know for actors in science fiction having <laughs> fake languages is a is a thing that they have to do anyway, but I would think it would be harder if you're trying to do it with English words as opposed to, you know, say Klingon. So mm. um, it's it's interesting. Uh, and I, I did find it interesting that, yeah, he did provide them with the actual dialogue that would be appropriate in that situation so they could make it believable. What, one thing that I think is interesting about this, and I'm glad, is they didn't try to fully mimic real-world aphasia because some of the real-world aphasias are ones where the person has trouble coming up with sensible speech and knows that's what's happening. So they'll be like, oh, it's, it's, I, you know, and they just can't come up with the word they want. Right. And that would be really frustrating to listen to 45 minutes of that. So I much right. prefer the, the more fluid, you know, first thing that popped into my frond type <laughs> aphasia. You know, it's interesting because I, I, I've, um, this is part of my life here, not in, a, not in a daily fashion, but most recently, my father-in-law had a stroke several years ago, and he has a, a, a form of aphasia, not, not nearly as bad as this, of course. He commu can communicate, but he often, he, and he was visiting us recently, and he often has this trouble trying to, you know, it's, it's the word. It's, he knows it's, it's the word he's trying to find, and he keeps coming up with the wrong word, and he can't say the right thing, and it's very frustrating to see him be so frustrated uh but yeah having to do that throughout a 45 minute or episode that would have made it would have made a very, very different pacing for this and it wouldn't have worked so well that it, it would have been much a much slower pace to the episode in in recent years i've noticed you know because everyone forgets what they're trying to say from time to time but i've noticed in recent years that like in meetings and stuff i tend to finish other people's sentences for them a lot um <laughs> And and I, you know, 80, 90 percent of the time, I correctly guess what they're trying to say. But whenever someone gets a snag, I, my own personal tolerance for waiting is not <laughs> as great as it could be. And I'm really tempted to just finish that sentence for him. Uh, I had a girlfriend many years ago who uh, you know, obviously didn't work out, not because she wasn't Melanie. But um, the greatest gift she gave me was to make me recognize how often I would finish her sentences. and. And interrupt, <laughs> and uh, she quickly broke me of that habit. Uh, so mm -hmm. th that was that was a good thing she left with me. But yeah, uh, I, I, yeah, it's that uh, that desire to like that person. You know, you, I know what you're trying to say, and I'm going to jump in and say it, but I'm not going to. That would be frustrating. Yeah. Another aspect of this episode, kind of on the meta level, before we descend into the plot, sure, is this is the first episode of Deep Space Nine that has an Iris Stephen Burr story credit. Right, and I think the episode that it shows he's he's eventually going to become the showrunner for Deep Space Nine, and he kind of was the guy who shepherded the the awesome writers' room that the show eventually developed that made it so well written compared to other Star Trek series, and so it's nice to see his hand beginning to peek through, even though he didn't do the script in this one. He shares a story credit for it, and I think it shows that this is the. This is a definite, to my mind, improvement over previous episodes. It's better than A Man Alone and Past Prologue. Right. It is a little slowly paced and a little kind of padded and formulaic. Once you know the central premise, the rest is kind of paint by numbers. But it's well executed. And for a first season of a Star Trek show, I think it's, I think it's really nicely done. Although it does have first season one-word-itis. <laughs> I've noticed that the titles of many series is in their first season tend to have one word titles like mm. it, this is just Babel. And right. in the first season of Star Trek, we have things like Justice. And in the first season of X-Files, we have Space and Water <laughs> and things like that. You know what? You know who doesn't uh, suffer from that? Is Star Trek Discovery. Discovery, yeah. <laughs> also, the original series didn't suffer from that. They had more literary yeah. titles, but it seems like... For some reason, I mean, 
it, a lot of shows as they're learning their characters, they have these minimalist titles as like in it, the battle is a right. first season next gen episode. It's like, what? This is the only battle you're ever going to cover <laughs> in the history of this show. You guys got low ambitions. <laughs> right, right. You know, it's interesting that I mean, this is sort of a, 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 a tangent, but it's an interesting one. That subject of episode titles. You know, I think Star Trek, the original series, might have been among the first series where the title mattered, where they they placed a title on the story that uh, that the fans, the viewers, associated with it. A lot of you know the shows before that, they just were the next episode, and if they had a title, people didn't really pay attention. Yeah, but titles like, have become like, a like Bewitched or something. I mean, yeah. who knows what the title of a Bewitched episode is. Right. From the 60s. Or, or, yeah, or like Gunsmoke or any of those shows. Yeah, but where Star Trek, I mean, the fans really developed, it, especially because of also syndication, developed a connection to individual stories and their titles. Uh, so, and it's it sort of turning that on the head as was Friends, which which titled every episode The One Where, uh, oh. and, and then something else. Mm-hmm. So every episode of Friends is The One Where, you know, Rachel has yeah. a misunderstanding or something like that. Third Rock from the Sun had the name of the main character, Dick, in every title. So it'd be like <laughs> New Year's Dick or whatever if it's their right. New Year's episode. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So it, it's interesting that, that, yeah, that observation of the first season-itis, one, one word-itis. Uh, so we have uh, the, the Deep Space Nine, which is still newly in the hands of Starfleet and, and the Bajorans, and it's still broken broken by the Cardassians uh, abandoning it. And mm-hmm. I like this. I like it. I like the broken. This is one of the things that sort of distinguishes DS9. It's not the sleek new starship. It's the broken old station uh, yeah, that and, they and deal if, with. If, if you think about it, you know, a season at this time was like 24 to 27 episodes. It's about half a year, and they're meant to be stretched out over the course of a year. So this is being the fourth episode. This is about, you know, two months in to right. their occupancy of the station. There would be a lot of broken stuff. Yes, yes. And so, uh, you know, the engineering, the engineers uh, on staff led by uh, O'Brien are, you know, uh, overworked. <laughs> They're run ragged and being dragged here and there. And uh, we, we have uh, these people stuck in an airlock. They can't get out. They've been stuck. In there. And I, I kept thinking to myself, why don't they just beam them out of the airlock and, th- and then you know, fix the airlock at your leisure <laughs> instead mm. of like having them banging? But, you know, OK. Good uh, question. And then there's, and so he's got this other freighter captain, Captain who, Jahil, who is a Boslik. Yes, uh, and we see other Bosliks in Star Trek. Yeah, yep, yeah, that is, yeah, he's not the only Boslik we see. Uh, it's interesting to me that Starfleet at this re- at this point, for some reason, is responsible for repairing civilian ships. You know, it like it's a they they've sort of taken over the the role of you know, running a shipyard or you know a, a civilian port, and so they. Mm-hmm. They're not only responsible for managing things coming and going, but even just the the day to day fixing people's ships and shopkeepers' mm-hmm. equipment and all that sort of stuff. That's sort of what Starfleet's doing here. Yeah, but a- for comparison, try that. You know, sail up to Miramar Naval Air Station off the coast of San Diego and try to get your v- civilian ship repaired. <laughs> yeah, that isn't going to work. And it's interesting. Again, we've talked, we've touched on like the economics of Star Trek, and that that there isn't a private business to do. Like just. Why not just have a private company come in and you're responsible for fixing ships? Just you just do that. We'll pay you, you know, some fee and you do that. That way we our our staff can concentrate on, you know, doing Starfleet stuff. But uh, it's just kind of interesting to me. That's yeah, how I well, would do it anyway. It, and it's how anybody would do it except because reasons, <laughs> you know, it keeps our characters involved in the plot. Yeah, I guess so. yeah, yeah, I know. I, I I'm I'm getting into the the fan uh, overthinking thing weeds. Uh, so, as I said, O'Brien is being run ragged, fixing everything here, there, and everywhere, and he repairs a replicator, and uh, it turns out that there's some kind of device attached to it. We don't know what it is, and uh, to test the replicator, of course, he orders a cup of coffee, uh, tastes it, and uh, uh, it tastes fine, although he uh, uh, orders a double repl- sweet. Uh, <laughs> yeah, black double sweet, which is actually how he's offered co- ordered coffee before in Next Gen, yeah. so that's consistent with his preferences, but... It's like this replicator was sparking or something just a minute before, you know, <laughs> yeah. and it's like, dude, I know it's supposed to have a biofilter to protect you, but drinking faulty replicator coffee is really dangerous. I mean, you <laughs> right. should at least wave a tricorder over that first. 
Right. Yeah. Because what was it? Uh, he, he was fixing the the replicators on the command level because Cisco had gotten a really bad cup of coffee uh, and yelled at him. <laughs> and uh, it, it, O'Brien, who was tired, sort of uh, like explodes back, starts muttering to himself, and it was such, it's so great. It was like I felt I fell for him because I've been like that, like a, like as the dad around the house, you know. Yeah. Sure. Got nothing else to do. Got to go fix up the. The running toilet again. Sure, why not? <laughs> yeah. This this won't come up for a while, but my favorite O'Brien coffee moment is in a later episode where he and and Dr. Bashir have been on a station and they're like disarming bioweapons for some alien race. Right. And there's an accident and they're disintegrated when the weapons go off. And some I guess some system is triggered and they're apparently disintegrated. And Keiko becomes obsessed with the security footage of them doing this procedure and runs a spectral analysis on the coffee that Miles is drinking and notices it has caffeine. But the timestamp indicates it's afternoon, and she just knows Miles never drinks caffeinated coffee in the afternoon because it keeps him up at night. And she uses this fact to show that the security footage is faked, and Dr. Bashir and Miles are really alive and being held prisoner. And she gets him out, and at the end of the episode, they're in sick bay, and she's talking to Miles now that she's got him back. And he says, "How did you know the security footage was fake?" And she says, "Well, you were drinking caffeinated coffee, and you never do that in the afternoon." And he says, "Sure, I do." <laughs> that, that is like the the greatest uh, marriage moment in Star Trek. By the way, that is that is marriage in a nutshell. Like, wait, you never drink. Of course I do. and yeah. But that everything hinged on that. That is so awesome. My favorite Keiko bit is yeah. where she becomes possessed by a paw wraith. Uh -huh. And you know how whenever anyone's possessed, they're always so sinister and everything and yeah. zombie-like? And she's just totally relaxed. And she's eating, she's, she's eating, you know, candies and saying, Miles, you're really not going to let me eat all of these, are you? <laughs> and she's just being totally friendly, even though she's possessed by an evil being. Yeah. And he's like huddling in the corner. <laughs> away from her. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's interesting to, to think about how much coffee plays a part in DS9. You know, e even in like in TNG, it was, uh, it was the captain's tea, the Earl Grey tea, but it was just the captain. But in DS9, like, everybody drinks coffee. Like, it yeah. eventually becomes Klingon coffee, Ractagino. And there's a real coffee culture in, in, in this episode, which must be something that has to do with the writers in the writer room, you know, Ira oh, Bear yeah. or somebody. Uh, I just, I love that little detail, that sort of, th that thread throughout the whole thing where everybody is into coffee and the different kinds of coffee and everybody has their order. And it's just, it makes it feel that much more real. Yeah, well, and it really, they should have had that on every Star Trek episode because the military runs on coffee. Yes. Um, but it's certainly, these people are working in an office, and offices run on coffee. It's another <laughs> bit of DS9 realism. That's true. That's true. So uh, then we, we go to Quark's, where uh, business is a little slow because his replicators are down, which makes me also wonder, how does Quark have a business when people could just go to a replicator and get stuff? Because that's essentially what he does. For for a lot of his business, apparently, at least in this episode, it kind of tells us he does that. Well, apparently the other, I mean, this is not a Federation, even though the Federation is running the station, it's n not a Federation outpost per se. And so you have different restaurants like Quark's and the Klingon restaurant, and you have the Jumja stick sellers and a replimat. And sure, people could, if they're Starfleet, I guess, they could go to their replicator in their quarters and get whatever they wanted. But you don't get the social experience of dining out and having hand-prepared food, which I guess is supposed to still be somewhat better than replicated food. Right. But I assume even with the replimat, they're really paying for that. There's some concession that runs the replimat. It's not Starfleet. And I guess at Quarks, it's the atmosphere, it's the games, it's the being out, the, so, that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, the hollow suites, everything. So uh, uh, there's a customer at Quarks, who, the, the only customer, who gets angry because uh, he doesn't like his replicated soup and starts force-feeding it to Quark. Uh, and Odo steps in and, and has to save Quark from the angry customer, uh, to his delight. Um, and then... Uh, he drops a hint, something about, uh, oh, well, O'Brien just fixed the replicators on the command level, even though your replicators are broken. And so Quark uh, gets this idea, you know, which he's going to do, which is start supplying his business from Starfleet's, you know, special replicators that he's not supposed to have access to. But he gets this information 
because he's apparently got security uh, clearance, security access yeah. sur- surreptitiously to everyone lo- on the station. I-, I love how this plays out because he goes to his computer and says, you know, dis- display a diagram of all of the repaired replicators on the command level. And it says security verification required. So he turns around, opens up a drawer, and there are all these data rods in it <laughs> of security clearances. He just yep. picks the right one, sticks it in, and here are all the repaired replicators in the crew quarters. <laughs> yeah, it makes you wonder, what else can Quark just f- find out uh, through his uh, his uh, his uh, clandestine access? Yeah, I love how it's just so natural. He's just got him sitting there, and they don't even point it out to yeah. us. We just see this, so they don't over-explain it to us. But he's got all kinds of clearances he shouldn't have. Yeah, just sticks him in, and the computer just says, clearance verified, and there you go. <laughs> he's got it. So then we have uh, O'Brien uh, on the on the uh, ops. He's, you know, got things fixed, and starts mixing, wor- you know, uh, odd words into his speech, you know, inappropri- yeah. uh, malapropisms uh, into his speech. Cisco says to him to uh, give his uh, regards to Mrs. O'Brien because Jake says she's an awesome teacher. And, and the, f- the first bizarre thing that Miles says is, oh, she's flower units about the lad herself. <laughs> and she's what? She's very fond of the lad herself. Right, right. And that's, uh, you know, that, again, that whole thing about switching things out, the fond of flower units, you know, that's sort of... Yeah, and so it, there's, there's even a little positive reference there with flower units, right? You know, that right, sounds like a happy thing, right? So it's a th- if it's kind of like this hint of like de- like early dementia there. Um, then uh, we have Dax and uh, Kira on the promenade, and I it's very interesting Dax talking to Kira about remembering what it's like to get uh, the attention as a woman as opposed to have having been Curzon for eighty some odd years or whatever it was. Now she's remain. Oh, this is what it's like to be a woman and getting all that male attention that she uh, used to get, but when she was a woman before. And it's kind of I, I thought that was an interesting little back and forth that they had there. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, it's then- interesting there are different reactions because Dax is much more adventurous. I'm not sure how that would be classified on the Myers Briggs scale, but she's like rolling with it. She's right. all about as a trill. She's all about acquiring new experiences and stuff. And so she's she's like, actually, I like this attention. Whereas Kira is like, look at me, and I'm going to punch you in the face. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. Kira is the opposite, and, and it, I do like these differences. I like that they they have these different characters, these different personalities. Uh, you know, it doesn't all have to be the same sort of uh, character there. Uh, the, the, and but yet they're friends and they're interacting, and w- you'll see how they sort of pick up from each other over time. They'll they'll really. As that relationship goes, again, one of the great things with DS9 is how the relationships among the characters change them, the different people as they go. Um, so it's uh, you know, and then Quark is you know uh, apparently got everything uh, running smoothly in the bar again. He's got lots of customers, business is booming, and uh, Dax stops in for an Idanian double whip spice pudding or whatever it is. Uh, where, whereas Kira says, no, no, I got to go back up to ops. So Dax indulges in some of the replicated food and Kira doesn't. And that, that'll be important later. Um, in fact, uh, O'Brien starts to show even more problems and then Dax will eventually start to show problems too. Yeah. Uh, Brashear says that the aphasia tests he's been running on miles don't show the normal Damp brain damage you'd see. I like that they point out that this is normally caused by brain damage. Right. And he's not finding that on the tests. And then Cisco like asks Dax to do something and suddenly she has aphasia and she gets it really fast. Right. She's just like, apparently there's an initial I'm feeling hot phase before the aphasia breaks out. And she goes from that to not making any sense in just a few seconds. Right. And after that, get, then, though, helps uh, Brashear because he can run a comparison on their blood and finds that it's a virus that's affecting their brain. And so it's not lesions in the brain that's coming up the language center. It's this virus. Yeah, and, and it, that randomly reroutes the synaptic pathways Yeah, is how he and, describes it. And so uh, Cisco, at that point, quarantines the station, which, as you do. When yep. there's an uncontrollable sci-fi virus on the loose, <laughs> that's right. Uh, and and but Quark, uh, claiming that it, his business is essential services, it says that's why he stays open. Uh, then uh, the the same ship captain who complained earlier, Jahil, 
uh, who was complaining to O'Brien earlier, asks Cisco to let him leave, and it, because he's afraid of the virus. And Cisco says, "No, that's that's the definition of a quarantine: is you can't leave, even if you're not showing symptoms yet, you still can't leave. That's that's how it works." Yeah, and he makes the obviously very sensible point. It, even though none of your crew is showing symptoms now, you don't want to get out in space and suddenly lose the ability to communicate with your ship. Yeah, that would be very bad. Uh, and then when confronted. Quark, you know, claims that Rom fixed his replicators, uh, and, whereas Odo knows it's a lie because Rom is an idiot who couldn't find a straw if it was bent. Which is funny, given how uh, eventually Rom will become that mechanical engineering genius who could yeah. have done this. So yeah, it's kind he's of the, funny. He's the evil treasonous genius who develops the self-replicating shielded stealth mines to block the wormhole. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Quark saves us from the Dominion. Uh, Rom saved us. I'm sorry, yeah. yeah. Rom saves us from the Dominion. So uh, it turns out that, yes, uh, Roto does uh, cap, uh, catch Quark using the command-level replicators, and that's how everyone got infected through Quarks. So so if Quark hadn't done what he'd done, it only would have been in the Starfleet personnel, and, and that would have been it. And they would, it would have been easier to contain the, uh, the virus. But because Quark broke the rules, everybody got infected. Uh, right. And... And as Bashir says, at first, it's just you get it from the replicated food, but because right. it was a large because, enough population. Be, be, because that device is apparently overriding yes. the biofilters that That's right. normally would apply. They were sabotaged, yeah. Yeah. But then, because it's got into a big enough population, as you were saying, Dom, the virus yeah. is going to go viral. <laughs> it goes viral, right. <laughs> uh, the worst kind of meme. And it mutates to an airborne vi- variety. So. Uh, so they Kira, because everybody else has been uh, infected, Kira is sent to find the the, the sabotage device, and um, she finds it and immediately claims it's Cardassian, which is kind of interesting. She says, oh, the Cardassians booby-trapped the station when they left it. Well, and she, she it's not unreasonable. It has a Cardassian power pack in it. So right. it's Cardassian technology. What right. she doesn't realize is it was made by Bajoran terrorists using the Cardassian technology they had available to them. Right. I, I think Kira had a little bit of confirmation bias in that sense. Was, yeah, was sure. what I'm thinking. Uh, yeah. So, But Bashir finds out that it actually was, yeah, it used Cardassian technology, but it was a Bajoran plot that dates back to when the, the station was built, uh, which uh, they say the station was built 18 years ago, but that doesn't actually jibe with uh, later information we have about the station. The station is much older than that, really. Hmm. It, I th- I think because we have don't we have at some point we have Kira's mom like when they travel she travels back in time and Kira's mom on the station or something like that. Yeah, but Kira's like late twenties, early thirties. So eighteen years ago she would have been a child. Is she that young? I guess. Yeah, she's not in her forties. No, I guess not. I see. This is this is all that that problem with having watched this when I was much younger. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she seemed older, but now that I look at it, yeah, she's actually much younger than I am, which is really disconcerting to think about. Because <laughs> uh, the the actress uh, Terry Farrell is only twenty eight when when this, yeah, yeah, it's at, true. At least she's not an Ocampo with a seven year lifespan. <laughs> yes, yes, we we don't have that. Uh, all right, so then uh, we have this very affecting moment again where Jake is infected and Cisco is understandably upset and. Avery Brooks later would say that this scene was where he really started to establish the idea of a father's physical intimacy with his son. Uh, you know, so the father constantly hugging and kissing his son. And uh, the director for this episode, I forget who it was, um, the director, Paul Lynch, would say that this relationship between Cisco and, and Jake was the linchpin for the episode, that this was really the hmm. emotional center of this episode. and really provided that, you know, that Cisco wasn't just about solving the problem and, you know, saving the crew, but about saving his son. And and I don't know that I'd say it's the linchpin, but it's certainly a notable element. And I like how Avery Brooks underplays it. He does yeah. not become a hysterical, overacting father. You must yes. save my son at all costs. He knows he's working with professionals. They're going to do their job. And he just is of what comfort he can to his son without getting hysterical about it. Yes, but and and yet you can still feel that uh, emotion, T- tension I, I, on his part. Yeah, right. Uh, I really again, I just I love the way Cisco plays his relationship with 
uh, Avery Brooks plays Cisco's relationship with Jake uh, in this series. So um, O'Brien, then he gets a fever, the, the disease advances, and then he's unconscious. Um, and Bashir says, unless I find some way to contract the virus, he'll be dead in 12 hours. And yeah. there's our clock. Because <laughs> it's uh, attacking his, uh, his autonomic nervous system now. Right. I did wonder where Keiko was in all this. We do, we don't have her at all. Yeah, or Molly. Or and Molly, I, ass- yeah. I assume whenever, I mean, they could just be <laughs> quarantined in their quarters. Yeah. But I always tend to assume whenever Keiko's not around that she's down on Bajor doing botany or something. Yeah, yeah. Has Molly with her. Right. So Kira is on this hunt. She's a, you know, a, d- on this detective hunt for the Bajorian scientist who created the virus, but it turns out he's dead. Yeah, his name is Deacon Elig. Yeah, which I like that. I like the the Deacon, which is like decontamination. That's or kind Deacon of a... is in a church. <laughs> or de- yes, right. Um, but she, since he's dead, she finds his the guy who signed his death certificate, who's a doctor named Sir Mac Wren, which is right. a wink to Wren and Stimpy. Right. Yes, uh, there are a number of Red and Stimpy uh, references uh, sprinkled throughout Deep Space Nine, and this is one of them. Uh, so, yes, he signed the death certificate, but he also turns out, she finds out, that he was uh, Deacon's um, assistant. assistant, medical assistant, when he was developing the virus. He's now an administrator of a, of a hospital and refuses to talk to her. So she goes on board a runabout, flies to above the, uh, above the hospital and beams him aboard and infects him. Yeah, now now this is interesting because he's not talking to her. He breaks the connection, and Kira's immediate response is, I'm going to go kidnap this man. <laughs> right. And so she comes up to, Oda, to Ops to get the keys to a runabout, and at that <laughs> moment, Cisco is telling Odo, you're going to have to help me run the station, even though you're a cop, you're going to have to help me run this thing because everyone <laughs> right. else is getting sick. And Odo's protesting, and it's like, what other choice do you have? Um, and then Kira announces her plan to go kidnap Cermak. And I'm going, really? You can't just, like, have the Bajoran government lean on this guy in an emergency circumstance? <laughs> right. But uh, but Odo c- goes to bat for Kira and says to Cisco, hey, what other option do you have? So Cisco lets her go kidnap this man. Right. You know, and he, he, he points out, you, you you're not allowed to set foot on the planet and she says it's not my plan so obviously she's she's going to bring him up and then he's going to be infected because this thing is airborne now so she's going to go kidnap and infect a another man and cisco is okay with that right she's effectively i mean uh, committing a, a kind of assault i mean it's yeah. a criminal offense but yeah i mean this she's is committing this is again... two major two major crimes i mean these have to be felonies under bajoran <laughs> law <laughs> right right I mean, this is the sort of the, the problem with a problem that Deep Space Nine has, which is you don't want to have the story so big that it it, it overruns the, the 45 minutes. And so you have the government and stuff and you want your character solving the problem in, you know, making the solution on the station or, you know, within the confines of the story instead of, you know, having the Bajoran government solving things and things hap- being solved off screen. There are still ways you could do it, though. Right. I w- if I was writing this episode, she would have, as she does on other occasions, gotten on the phone to the provisional government and said, yeah. here's what's happening. We have an emergency. You must make this man cooperate. And then the next thing that would happen is he would be arriving on a Bajoran spaceship in a hazmat suit yeah. to come in and take charge of the investigation. Because right. at this point, uh, Dr. Bashir has had his gold window moment. And the word base correlation suddenly became gold window on the screen in front of him. Right. And so he's useless now. So we need a new medical expert in here to deal with the uh, scientific aspects of the question. And that can totally be Cermak. Sur- he just needs to be wearing a hazmat suit. Right. You know, it's interesting how often they, and how well they play this idea of, you know, th- they were the resistance and now they're running things and they were terrorists and now they're respectable people who run hospitals, you know, and just the, the, the history that they have to deal with and how the individuals, as well as the, the society, deals with, you know, I used to be this person, but now I'm, uh, I'm, now I'm a respectable member of society, and how they, 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 they maneuver around that and how everybody kind of knows. It's, and, I, I, I like and, that. And yes, and, but given that, Cermak should not have this I'm not talking to you thing going on. I mean, right. if he's a respectable conscience 
you know, guy who's running a hospital and cares for people. And yeah, okay, he used to be a terrorist. And yes, he did help on this project. Now that project is killing, is is about to kill Bajorans. He should be all over. I want to help. But I I like the idea that it's complex. It's not what like he's he doesn't immediately leap to it. Like he's a it's a complex character. I mean, it could be yeah, someone but, who's like I don't care. I'm just a terrorist. You know. I, so I, I I know, and I I can handle the complexity, but they need yeah. to give me a reason. What's the reason he doesn't want to help? I mean, okay. you know, what there has to be something he's trying to avoid by cutting off contact with Kira, and I need to know what that thing is. And it needs to be more than, oh, I did things I'm not proud of. Yeah, right. you may have done things you're not proud of, but if you're a man of conscience, you're going to want to clean up the mess you helped make. Yeah, and when... maybe he's not a man of conscience, but yeah. Then the, they need uh, to tell me that. Right, right. The All we get is, um, I was on the underground for six months before we were captured. I'm not responsible for this. And that's all, that's all we get. We don't get much character development in that. The, so... Uh, the, you're, you're right in that sense. It, was, it, it would be nice to get that developed a little more. Yeah. Uh, so that, what, what I really like, though, there's a moment early on where Bashir is like, "You need to find whoever made this thing and get the antidote from them." And I'm going, "If <laughs> if, if you're a terrorist, why do you make an antidote? There is no antidote, you know." And <laughs> yeah. and and in this case, yes, Cermak says there is no antidote, and that right. is so awesome because. That's what that's what terrorists with uh, limited funding and so forth would do <laughs> is they would make the destructive thing, but not have a magic potion to wish it away. Right. It's I mean it's sort of a Starfleet thing. You make the the destructive thing, but always you know, have a safety valve. But yeah, terrorists. <laughs> yeah, they, they they're not necessarily looking to make an antidote. Uh, so Captain Jahila is back, the Bosslik Freighter cr- Captain, and he's trying to leave the station. Um, even though they wouldn't let him go, and he's going to destroy his ship and half the docking ring, uh, trying to do it, trying to uh, yeah, he's pull he's, out. he's he's playing uh a game of chicken with the station. It's like I'm going to back out of these thing. I'm going to back out of this thing. You better release the docking clamps, right? And he starts backing out of it, and he's right. They will release the docking clamps to let him go, lest he take out a bunch of the ring. But because he's pulling on it, it's now warped it so the docking clamps are not retracting. Right. And he's putting so much stress on his ship that his power core ruptures and they're going to have 15 minutes till fuel cell collapse, which will blow up everything. And they therefore need to go down there and release the dock, blow using explosives, blow the docking clamps manually. Right. It's 15 minutes to the second. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, And by this point, the only two people on the station running things are Odo and now Quark, who is apparently immune to the the virus, and uh, so Quark is up in ops, and uh, he he offers to beam Odo to the damaged ship, and just as Odo gets on the thing, he goes, "Oh yeah, I must have seen someone do this a, a dozen times." Just as he materializes, dematerializes yeah. Odo. <laughs> it, it's it, it. I know Odo starts to say, "Wait, you've never handled the controls," and that's when he beams <laughs> out, and it's a great bit of comic relief. This this is nice. Quark is nicely brought in here because it's plausible that he's immune and it's plausible that Odo's immune. And so you have these two rivals who secretly like each other but are at odds who right. are, you know, the ones to take charge in this situation. And Because Cisco's got it now. And he went straight from speaking nonsense to being unconscious. So it's apparently right. the virus is getting more aggressive. But... Quark sends out like a if or I think it's actually Cisco who sends out the first one. If anyone can understand me, come up to ops, right? Because we need you. And Quark shows up, and Odo is like, "You're volunteering." And Quark is, "Who said anything about volunteering? <laughs> we can discuss my hazard pay later." <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I like when uh, Odo is pulling Jahil out of his burning uh, uh, ship uh, just before blowing the docking clamps. Jahil is is has the aphasia dog fellow distance and Yoda's like yeah tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> I was amazed that Jahil's uh, brain cross connected uh, one of his native words to an Earth animal like a dog. <laughs> yeah, that's not a Boslik thing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a Boslik dog because yeah, that's oh, okay. we all all animals are like uh you know a, a Sedalian bat or whatever you know <laughs> it's, yeah. we, we just have the a, a alien word in front of it so uh. Quark is left in control in ops, so he's the only one up there now. Yeah, but notice when Odo blows these things, it's like we're down to 10 seconds from the boom. Yes. And it's like, that's okay. It's a little tropey, guys. 10 (laughs) seconds. 
Right. So uh, Armin Shimmerman says that this scene, this moment in the in the episode, is when he felt like he got a grasp on the character of Quark. Uh, there's a quote from him. He says, Ah, this is the character, this guy who likes to have a good time, who enjoys life and feels that no problem is insurmountable. And that fun-loving spirit and delight became ingrained in my character at that moment. So despite the fact that they're in this apocalyptic, you know, pre- precipice of of destruction, you know, Quark is still, you know, punking Odo and, you know, talking about getting paid. And that that's Quark, you know, even in in the midst of that. So I, I like that, that this is the moment when Armin Shimmerman gets Quark. One of the most successful characters in this series, I have to say. Yeah, who's almost almost single-handedly, but with the help of Nog and Rom and Mugi, redeems the, the Ferengi. Ferengi. Yes, exactly. That's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, because the Ferengi of TNG were terrible. Um, so the, the Bajoran doctor, Cermak, uh, quite quickly finds the antidote uh, based on Bashir's previous work, while, uh, like you said, Odo disconnects the exploding freighter in time. And then the, and then everybody gets the antidote, and we're all better. Uh, yeah, very quickly at the end. And then we have an annoying coda that's meant to be funny but isn't, where Cisco goes to get a cup of coffee at Ops, and it tastes sour or something, and he immediately yells at Odo. No, and it's Bri- almost, O'Brien. I'm mean, sorry. He immediately yeah. yells at O'Brien to, about it, and you can almost hear the clarinet of of irony. You know, wah wah wah. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's a bit sitcom ish. Like they like they didn't know how to end the episode or something. But yeah, no. Yeah, it, what would have been stylish? They could have gone the same way. I mean, he could have taken a a drink of the coffee, and by his reaction, it could have been very bitter. They could have shown yeah. us that. And then he could have turned to O'Brien, and you could have O'Brien look at him fearfully, like, I'm going to have to fix that thing now. And he could have said, oh, Mr. O'Brien, take the day off. Yeah, yeah. Or you something. Know, yeah. Something nice. Right, right. So do you think the virus was a, a like a hokey cliche, an overused trope? Um, you know, so some people thought that the, that, you know, looking at this episode, that it was, oh, this is sort of a, an overused sort of plot device. That we saw lots in Star Trek and Next Gen and the original series of, oh, uh, this week we have this this thing that's about to kill us all. Whereas we, they, people thought maybe we should have had more character driven plots at this stage of the series. What do you think about that? I I don't. I mean, obviously, character driven stuff is where they're going, and that's good. But it takes a while to get there. You can't in in a sci fi series. There's a certain amount of world building that has to happen, and we actually have you know, character development in the course of this episode between Jake and Cisco and between Odo and Quark and between Jadzia and Kira and even even with O'Brien as the put upon every man. You know, we have a good bit of character on display in this episode. I didn't mind the virus at all. I do I do think it is a cliche when we have some medical emergency of an dangerous but unspecified nature. You know, there's a planet that has a a raging plague on it. So you will have no treaty, no vaccine, (laughs) and no Lieutenant Yar. And it's like, okay, that's boring and uninteresting. Right, right. This is, okay, aphasia is a real condition. And, And they, you know, this is a virus that does something intelligible and that interacts with real world conditions and is a plausible extrapolation. I mean, we don't have anything like this on Earth, but this is a plausible extrapolation of real world things that creates a credible medical threat. And you think about how dependent everybody is on communication, both in their personal life and with the technology that's keeping them alive to suddenly lose that. That's an interesting, incredible threat. So I really yeah. like the aphasia virus in this, partly also because linguistics is one of my hobbies. And so I've, I've studied about aphasia, but I mm-hmm. think it's a cool thing. And it's better than a lot of the non-specific medical threats we get in other episodes. Right, right. The Yeah, various flus and fevers and things. Yeah. You know, it, it is it, one of the things if I had a criticism, it's that how like we just talked about the coda, how quickly we just kind of wrap it up. You know, we, we we get to that climactic moment and then it's like they had way too much story and we oh we we've got we've got like a minute to to finish things up 
We have a, a, a log entry where Cisco says, oh, Sir Mac Rand found the antidote and cured everybody. And then it's, you know, O'Brien, bad coffee. And, and that's it. And it felt a little rushed at the end. I'm not sure if there was, I, I guess, I mean, what, what's left to say? I mean, we could have had a uh, reflective moment of people standing around ops at consoles t- talking about it like Voyager would have done. But, but I, I suppose we could have had Kira being arraigned. Yeah, we could have had kidnapping that. and 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 infection with a deadly pathogen uh, charges. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Uh, yeah, it. it I, I suppose it's just a, a a feature of the way the shows were being made then, as opposed to later on, we'll get things that carry over from episode to episode. But um, yeah, this it just felt like, like a rushed ending, but. Maybe I don't, I don't the mind the everybody's all better now part. I just mind the bad coffee at the end. If they yeah. had fixed that, it would have been okay. Yeah. To me. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So uh, anything left to say about this episode, Jimmy? Nope. I think that's it. Okay. So uh, before we wrap up, I want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Star Trek, including Matt T, Dennis W, John S, John V, and Keith K. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to cr- continue the secrets of Star Trek and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. All right, so that's it from us. What did you think of Babel, this Deep Space Nine episode? Let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash trek or our Facebook page, facebook.com slash Media. Or send us an email to trek at sqpn.com. We'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the Voyager episode, Eye of the Needle. Until then, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for joining me in sharing the secrets of Star Trek. Looking forward to another Voyager episode where the Voyager <laughs> escapes through something as they stand over consoles talking tensely. <laughs> thank right. you and live long and prosper. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Star Trek on StarQuest. And remember, round the turbulent quick. Well, close the reverse harbor. Ankle try sound. Reset gleaming. Dinner to bug. I think that was all of the, <laughs> the basic dialogue. <laughs>